And we have a very interesting topic today, a topic you have spent a lot of time researching. You've written a book about this. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how diet affects menopausal changes. So how did you discover that foods could help hormone related problems in the first place? You know, up until now, people really haven't thought much about hormones. They thought I eat something bad like a double bacon cheeseburger and then something bad will happen to me, like my cholesterol will go up or I'll have a heart attack or something. But hormones affect everything in our body. And if the hormones are not working right, whether that hormone is insulin or estrogens or testosterone or thyroid hormone, then things really get into all kinds of trouble. So we've been looking at this for a long time. And with regard to menopause, this is the time of a woman's life where so many health issues coalesce. Not only is she likely to have hot flashes that drive her crazy during the transition, but this is also when she's worried about, okay, weight gain is now going to be an issue for me. My, I'm, at, I'm at higher risk of heart disease and maybe breast cancer. And in the not too distant future, I'm going to start worrying about uh, perhaps cognitive changes. And so all of these things come in at, at menopause. But re really to answer your question more directly, how, how did we get this idea? The, the research really started with international comparisons where the experience is just dramatically different. If you look at rural Japan, you look at rural Mexico, and then you look at rural New Jersey, completely different. So <laughs> we drew some lessons from that and went from there. And, and, and what did you see? What, what are those differences? Well, for starters, let's say you're in Japan. In fact, rural or urban Japan didn't really matter too much. If it was the 1970s, there wasn't even a Japanese word for hot flashes. Women went through that transition really with pretty comfortably. Um, and researchers from McGill University in Canada interviewed more than a thousand Japanese women. And they found themselves asking, are these women just kind of reticent? They just don't want to talk about hot flashes? Or are they really not having them? And the answer is they were really not having them. Fewer than 15% of women reported them at all. However, here was the big change. Um, 1990s, 2000s, the Golden Arches came in, Burger King came in, Western eating habits came in in a big way. It was not a dairy-based diet before dairy came in in a big way. Uh, there was some fish, but that increased more, and other kinds of meat came in, and rice started to plummet. Rice and other grains were being neglected. And then hot flashes came in to be about maybe 40% of postmenopausal women, and all the other things that go with it. Weight gain, much higher risk of breast cancer, and a lot higher risk of diabetes. So that really sets the stage. There's something about a plant-based diet that's protective. But the other piece of it is the soybean. Soybeans have natural isoflavones that are famous because they reduce breast cancer risk, maybe 30% or something like that. But they're also like hot flash medicine. Um, they're a natural way to reduce hot flashes. Their effect is rather modest. And the effect of a plant-based diet is maybe modest, but we decided that we would test this, putting the two together, the plant-based diet and the soybean isoflavones, and see what would happen if we combine them. Okay, this is amazing. I'm on the edge of my seat, Dr. Barnhart. <laughs> what did you find when you combined them? Um, well, I have to tell you a funny, a funny thing first, if you don't mind. Um, I, I wrote this book. Um, called your the your body in balance, and it was all about kind of an owner's manual to, to controlling your hormones. And in the book, I described what I just told you. And a woman reached out to me and said, "Dr. Brown, I want to tell you, I, I I did what you said, you know, all about soy products and and going vegan and everything, and my hot flashes were gone really fast." And I said, "How fast?" She said, five days." Five days. Wow. And I didn't. I didn't. Prom I didn't promise that. <laughs> I was really surprised. So I asked her. I said, "Tell me exactly how you interpreted what I wrote in that book." And the reason I'm telling you this is, she had a very specific way of doing it. It was 100% plant-based, no animal products at all. Her oils were extremely low, but she also said, "I didn't use edamame or soy milk. I mean, those are okay, but she got whole mature soybeans." And that made a light bulb go off in my head because if you're at a Japanese restaurant and they give you that bowl of edamame, that's immature soybeans. And if you leave them on the vine for a little while longer, the isoflavones mature too. And they're in a much higher quantity in the mature soybean. And so I thought, all right, here's what you're doing. 
you are on a vegan diet, plant-based diet, so you've got healthier gut bacteria, you're getting the, the maximum dose of isoflavones, the gut bacteria can also change those isoflavones into other forms that are more active, and your hot flashes just go bang, gone. So I thought, this is my theory. But, they, but this is one person. So we brought in 38 women and split them into two groups, and there was a control group and a group that did exactly what this woman did, down to a T. She said, I used an Instant Pot. I gave everybody Instant Pots. She said, I used Laura brand non-GMO soybeans. So I gave everybody Laura brand non-GMO soybeans. <laughs> this is and great. We did, we did ex, ex, her name is Betty, and this is a research study designed actually to test Betty's experience. <laughs> this is so good. And what happened was that the moderate to severe hot flashes did indeed drop by 84%. And um, 60% of the women didn't, at, by week, it was a 12-week study. By the end of the study, they didn't have any of these uh, moderate to severe hot flashes. They might occasionally have um, an episode where they would say, I feel a little warm. Am I having a hot flash or is it just warm in here? But, but that was it. Um, they could sleep through the night. Um, the troubling hot flashes were, were pretty much gone. They were five a day at the beginning, less than one a day at the end. And, uh, oh, and you know, you, you see this in, in the work that you do, where you, you're working with people, if they've got a little extra weight to lose, they lose weight. And the average person lost eight, we, eight pounds in, um, 12 weeks time. Uh, their GERD goes away. All, all the things that you've, that you've, that you've seen. You know, their joints feel better, their energy's better, they're sleeping better. And so, you know, I got to tell you, they just described this as during a time in my life when I'm vulnerable to things, when I'm feeling unhealthy and feeling maybe even less attractive and, and feeling worried about where I'm going, suddenly they realized that, that these dietary changes were fueling them to feel better than they had felt in sometimes decades, um, more energy, more, more vitality. So anyway, it was it, a great it's, thing. I love hearing stories like that and how, you know, you focus on this one change. Hey, you know, we want to, you know, reduce hot flashes. We want to address, you know, menopausal concerns. And all of a sudden this laundry list of benefits comes along with it. That's always fun. And it's also amazing to see how quickly this stuff can turn around. I mean, a 12 week study, that's re remarkable results in a short period of time. So, and one of the nicest things that I, that I got to tell you that goes along with it is if I had just given them a medicine to knock out their hot flashes, that might affect them. But we didn't. It's food. And people eat with other people. So one of our part participants had a husband with diabetes. And so what do you think happens? He says, honey, what's to eat? <laughs> you know. And so he starts eating exactly the way you would have wanted him to eat. Um, be, because, because she, she's doing it for hot flashes. He's doing it to get his A1C back to where he's trying to get it to be. And that to me is sometimes the most rewarding thing that you'll get one person, kind of your index patient, but they talk to other people. They share food with other people. They inspire other people. Um, and they become sort of your arms and legs of, of spreading this life-saving message to others. I couldn't agree more. And another benefit, which I know you experienced through your work at PCRM as part of the reason the organization exists, is how these patients then impact their doctors. And their doctors now get exposed to these results by seeing what happened in them. What did you do? What's going on? How did you get these remarkable results? And then how many patients can then be impacted once you educate a doctor, it's this ongoing impact that's really beautiful. You are so right, and I often, I often, I often feel like how pathetic is that? That that the doctor who has spent four years in medical school, three or four or five years in residency, doesn't know the things that you have known about for a long time, and that we that our research has shown for for quite some time, and it's the patient that that maybe can maybe educates them, or it might also be that the patient brings it alive so the doctor can think this isn't just theoretical, this is doable. This is possible. In fact, the patient really likes it. They like it, <laughs> they, they like it better than the, than the prescriptions that I've been giving them.